Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> I support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? we
Friday, November 10th, 2023, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Vice President Kamala Harris files the paperwork putting President Joe Biden on the South Carolina 2024 presidential ballot, leading off the Democratic presidential primary. With Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville continues to block uh, hundreds of military nominees over the Department of Defense's uh, abortion policy. Virginia Democrats take control of both the Senate and the House. We'll talk with Delegate Don Scott, Virginia's House Democratic leader, who will become the first black speaker of the House in Virginia, about how that happened. Also, actor Eric LaSalle will join us to discuss his new book, The Law of Laws of Annihilation. Plus, we'll talk to the sculptor who created the Larger Than Life statue of Johnson Publishing Company founder John H. Johnson in his hometown in Arkansas. It is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Vice President Kamala Harris made a trip to South Carolina today. Uh, the goal? Uh, to file the paperwork to put President Joe Biden and her on the 2024 presidential ballot. South Carolina is going to lead off the Democratic presidential primary thanks to a White House-led schedule overhaul meant to empower black voters. The DNC approved a new 2024 calendar where South Carolina's primary will be on February 3rd. Nevada will be held, of uh, course, uh, three days later. The schedule also moves Michigan into the group of early states, voting before Super Tuesday on March 5th, when most of the country has primaries. In recent months, Harris has traveled the country to build excitement among young people and voters of color uh, when polls show that most Democrats believe Biden is too old for a second Turn my panel uh, joining me right now uh, from Detroit. Uh, Michael uh, Imhotep, host of the African History Network show. Joy Cheney, founder of JOI Strategies out of D.C. Matt Manning, civil rights attorney out of Corpus Christi, Texas. Glad to have all three of you. Joy, I want to start with you. 
Um, Lord, the white folks in New Hampshire and Iowa have lost their mind. They are still upset. They're mad. New Hampshire says, how dare you? They are still going to go first. Bottom line is Biden's name is not even on the ballot there. Uh, what you have going on there, you have uh, folks trying to write his name in there. Uh, and I I've always thought it to be incredibly arrogant. Uh, of New Hampshire and Iowa to think that somehow they knew better than everybody else and they had a right to only be the first two uh, to go. Uh, and I don't mind this change at all. No, I don't mind this change at all. So I'm a DNC alum and it was always sacrosanct for a long time that Iowa and New Hampshire had to be first. But we know that what was is not what is and that changes do have to be made. So I'm really thrilled to see this change. And I think that the country will be just fine. We are more diverse. We are, um, you know, than we've ever been. Um, and people are engaged and especially for the Democratic Party. We need to make sure the entire country is represented. And I think we're going to see the proof in the pudding. Seeing how what happens when South Carolina kicks things off will, will make a huge difference. Why should Iowa and New Hampshire set the tone for the rest of the nation? Um, and I hope my other panelists will agree. You know, uh, Michael, uh, again, I think back to 2008, when uh, Michigan and Florida, they wanted to have a greater say. They moved their primary. The Dems said, no, we're not going to count your delegates. Uh, and they didn't. Uh, even going, even after the fact, they still said, we're not counting your delegates. Uh, the parties control when they have these primaries. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the issue for me is, and, you know, forget the fact that uh, Biden ne never has done well in the first two states. I still believe that the move was good, it was necessary, and at some point, um, you got to put arrogant folks in their place. Uh, and if you're Iowa, New Hampshire, what they really are pissed off about is that the millions and millions of dollars that normally are spent in their states on hotels, television, radio, food, staff, all of those things, that ain't happening. And that's why they're upset. Well, that's part of the reason why they're upset. The other part of the reason why they're upset <clears throat> is because it moves to the forefront issues that are pertinent with the African American community. Okay. This is a this is another this is another reason. And it's going to have it's going to cause um other people who are running. Now, I'm not talking about other Democrats because that's just a waste of time. But it's gonna cause other people who are running and paying attention to have to shift their policy platform, okay? Uh, so this was a huge move. Now, what has to happen is that we have to capitalize on this and actually understand our own issues. Because as you talked about here on this show before, Roland, numerous times, as we deal with Tamika Mallory, as we talk to Cliff Albright, things like this, a lot of African Americans, unfortunately, don't understand our own issues and don't understand how to bring into fruition what it is that we even say that we want. But what this does is it pushes to the forefront policies that are critical and beneficial to the African American community. So this is a huge uh, win for African Americans, and I think it's going to benefit benefit the Democratic Party. And we have to remember, 16.9 million African Americans voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in 2020, and this is part of the dividends. This is part of the rewards of that. You know, uh, Matt. Um, again, the folks in Iowa, New Hampshire, the boy, they have been just beside themselves, uh, just so angry, so upset, um, and. Uh, it does change the focus on the issues that are talked about uh, as the outset uh, of the campaign, uh, in which I think is important. You take Nevada. Nevada, by being second, has a significant uh, Latino population. That changes uh, the focus, if you will. I, I was so sick and tired of hearing about them damn farmers and ethanol and, and, and all that crap. Uh, you know, in Iowa, and it was, and, and, and let's just be clear, the Iowa Democratic Party totally screwed up 
their caucus. I was on the set of CNN in 2012. We were there till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because they didn't know how to count, hell, only 200,000 people. Um, and I still think the caucus, the caucus system is stupid anyway. Um, but uh, again, I think, I think the change is good and necessary. Uh, and uh, it's going to make for a much more uh, interesting, you know, a, a much more interesting open primary in 2028. Well, and I think that the protest shows you that a lot of what you hear rhetorically as it relates to the issues is more virtue signaling, signaling than it is anything else, and that their self-interest is really what's driving a pushback against changing it to South Carolina, particularly as we see social issues always discussed, it's a lot of times liberal white people who are carrying the mantle for that. But when the opportunity comes for black issues to be at the forefront because of the sequencing, you see a pushback. So one, I think that kind of ferrets out who's really about what they say they're about. Um, but hopefully this will have a measurable effect too on the approval ratings in terms of how they do in that primary and in terms of putting our issues first, because I know right now, the Biden and the Harris administration is struggling with approval ratings as it relates to um, the Israel conflict. So I'm interested in seeing what hopefully a strong turnout there will have on, on that effect and on the effect of momentum with all the primaries. All right, folks, hold tight one second. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, New York Mayor Eric Adams. He's having some issues. FBI seizes his cell phones as well as his iPad in their investigation into whether or not foreign money uh, was used in his uh, to, in his mayoral race. We'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. A few days after federal authorities raided the home of the chief fundraiser for New York Mayor Eric Adams, causing him to uh, rush back from meetings in Washington, D.C., well, guess what? They, are, they now have uh, seized his phones. Uh, this is the New York Times story right here. FBI seizes Eric Adams' phones as campaign investigation intensifies. Uh, what the, the story laid out, that uh, FBI agents uh, approached, he says right here, the agents approached the mayor after an event at New York University on Monday evening and asked his security detail to step away. A person with knowledge of the matter said they climbed into his SUV with him and pursuant to a court-authorized warrant, took his devices. The devices, at least two cell phones and an iPad, were returned to the mayor within a matter of days. 
according to that person and another person familiar with the situation. Law enforcement investigators with the search warrant can make copies of the data on devices after they seize them. Now, again, this follows after the FBI raided the home uh, of the chief, um, the chief um, uh, fundraiser uh, for the mayor. Uh, this has been uh, in some of speculated uh, that uh, it dealt with, uh, again, the, the, uh, the work of 25 year old former intern Brianna Suggs. Now, her home was the one that was raided. She was the star fundraiser uh, for the mayor. Uh, he said that he uh, returned uh, from a trip to D.C. Literally, he landed in D.C. Feds had raided. He get, got back on a plane and flew back to New York. Uh, he said that he needed to be with his people as they went through a, a traumatic experience. Uh, Matt, I'll start with you. Um, when the FBI starts grabbing your cell phone and your iPads, you might want to worry a little bit. Two words, all bad. Um, if the FBI is, is poking around in your devices, that should really concern you. And a, a couple of things that I think people need to know. The first is it mentioned a warrant from the judge. What's concerning about that is a, a judge has to find that there's probable cause to search those devices. So this isn't just law enforcement saying, hey, we think you have information that may be pertinent to this. This is a judge saying, I believe that you've presented to me enough evidence that there may be a uh, probable cause, or rather there is probable cause to search those devices. Um, so that would be concerning. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs of, of federal um, campaign laws, but uh, recently I was asked to be counsel for a campaign. I'd never done it before. I called a friend of mine who works in that space, and she told me that the joke is FEC jail is real jail, meaning that the feds take very seriously any issues as it relates to campaign finance. So this would be concerning. Um, I will say, however, with him being the candidate, I don't know how intimately involved he would be and whether his devices really have that information on them. But I'll tell you, in my practice, uh, digital devices are bar none, uh, far and away today, what gets people in the most trouble, particularly because those cell phone dumps can find deleted images, deleted text messages, things you think you can hide cannot be hidden in, in phones the way you think that they can be. So this could be concerning if there's, in fact, um, information or evidence that they've done something against the law as it relates to their campaign finance. Uh, Joy, what do you make of this? You know, I want to wait and see. Um, just because he is the candidate, uh, we don't know all the details. Um, I think it makes sense to have his devices. Um, hopefully, they exonerate him and make it seem more at least... Um, remove one uh, source of evidence that he might have engaged in some wrongdoing. Um, FEC jail is real. I also think it's a reminder that, you know, for Trump and Republicans who believe that the FBI is biased against them, it's not true. The FBI is biased against uh, wrongdoers, right? People who break the law or who are suspected as breaking the law. With any luck, we will have an investigation here and it will not result in further charges. What I do hope is whatever the FBI decides that it does so quickly so that the people of New York can move forward. It is very hard to govern uh, when you have something like this hanging over you. And sometimes I worry with these types of investigations and prosecutions that sometimes they are done and, and they linger on. And the only people who really benefit, I mean, are hurt by it are the citizens, right? Because it distracts their leaders. So I hope that whatever they decide to do, they will do it thoroughly, decisively, but quickly. Michael. Um, yeah, Roland, you know, I was reading an article from the New York Times as well, and it seems like this investigation is um, it's a criminal inquiry into whether his 2021 campaign conspired with the Turkish government and others to funnel money into its coffers. So that just sounds, I don't know Mayor Adams personally, but everything I know about him through the media, uh, that just, um, that doesn't sound like him. We'll see how this plays out, this investigation. Um, but, you know, this is, a, this is a big development. This is not something that's good. But we'll see what they actually turn up as evidence. Um, Matt, uh, again, Adams, former New York, New York police uh, officer, uh, he has talked about how he is uh, very uh, much about uh, doing everything the right way. He says sometimes he's driven his step crazy uh, by that. 
but again, when you start talking about uh, getting money from foreign sources impacting elections, that is not something that they play about. Uh, and it is indeed a criminal investigation. Yeah, and I, I think Joy is right to remind us that we need to, you know, hold off until there's concrete evidence of wrongdoing, right? This is purely investigative at this point as far as we know. So, you know, we can't pass judgment on whether he did something wrong or didn't do something wrong. But I will say that, I mean, it's nonetheless concerning. And I'll say the problem a lot of times with law enforcement is that they don't necessarily have clarity on charges, but it's very easy for them to bring charges. So the concern a lot of times is just the appearance of impropriety because you're not even defending uh, real substantive charges yet. You're just a part of an investigation. And that alone is concerning because if they find anything that they want to try to make hay of, there's not anything that really stops them from that, particularly when they've gotten entree to those devices through a judge's warrant. So, you know, if there's information that exonerates him, I, I hope that's the case. But uh, it is concerning that he would be a part of this investigation because the feds don't play. And if they go get a warrant and a judge gives it to them, that's because they believe they have something that may be found in those phones. Matt, if you're on, if you're working on that campaign, um, what would you be advising all those folks to be doing right now? Well, first, I'd be making sure I had representation if I had reason to believe I might be part of that probe. But what I would be advising them to do is not making any statements about anything. I mean, I know one of the statements he made is that he's law enforcement and he'll cooperate. And while I like that in theory, uh, the unfortunate reality is if they're coming for you, you need to make sure you're protected. So I would be advising people not to delete evidence, not to delete any information, but also not to make any statements and absolutely not to talk to law enforcement without uh, counsel there because the problem is, you know, if you're not being Mirandized, if you're not in custody, they don't have to give you warnings. They can start asking you questions. And if you're caught off guard, you could imperil your own liberty and other people's liberty if you don't have uh, competent counsel. So I would say shut up. Let's talk about uh, student loan debt. One of the one of the interesting things uh, I've been looking at some of these, um, look at a lot of these comments, and I, I had somebody who uh, hit me up saying, you know, Biden has utterly failed us uh, when it comes to student loans, and I said, uh, well, that's kind of stupid. Uh, if 127 billion dollars has been forgiven from some 3.9 people. They also announced this week uh, a new student loan program that 5.5 million people have already enrolled in. Also, uh, they have laid out that some of the people, um, the, the, what they owe is so low that they don't have to actually make uh, annual payments. The, the, this right here to me, and, and look, I, I, I understand fully, um, uh, I understand fully, um, um, uh, Michael, what, People say, well, they say, well, Biden promised he was going to get rid of student loan debt. Well, let's see what happened. First and foremost, uh, he made the announcement. Supreme Court overruled him, ruled unconstitutional. So this notion that some people are running around saying, well, he failed us in doing so, strikes me as kind of stupid. It, it strikes you as kind of stupid because it is stupid, Roland. They don't understand what it is they're looking at. This goes back to 2016 when Donald Trump won through the Electoral College, because most people don't understand how the Electoral College works, and he was able to get three Supreme Court justices confirmed after Mitch McConnell helped to block Merrick Garland, who was Barack Obama's Supreme Court justice. So they flipped the, they, they flipped the U.S. Supreme Court and you have now a 6-3 conservative majority, and it was Donald Trump's 6-3 conservative majority with the help of um, uh, the um, Heritage Society, the Federalist Society, uh, the, the Heritage, um, Heritage Action uh, the, uh, in the Federalist Society, Leonard Leo. You have a conservative majority Supreme Court. They ruled against not just uh, uh, um, not just um, uh, the uh, student loan executive order from President Joe Biden, but also struck down affirmative action in college admissions, okay? So this is understanding that there are three branches of the federal government, not just the executive branch, which we definitely have to keep, but it's also the judicial branch of the federal government, federal courts, federal court of appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court, 
Okay, so this is why I tell people you have to read the U.S. Constitution, because if you don't understand the U.S. Constitution, you're not going to understand any of this and how all these parts come together. It's, it's, it's the same thing that's going on right now. We're about seven days away from possibly a government shutdown. And you have people who voted for Joe Biden. Maybe they didn't vote in the 2022 midterm elections, but don't understand that based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the U.S. Constitution, the power of the purse belongs to Congress, the ability to tax and spend. So the president, the White House submits an annual budget, but it's confirmed by both the House and the Senate. So we have to actually understand how this game is played so we can play the game to win as opposed to just being bystanders. Um, th this here is a uh, tweet that Walter Kimbrough, uh, Matt, put out. Um, and uh, this was an article. It was in Bloomberg. And he said the Supreme Court struck down President Joe Biden's plan to cancel as much as $20,000 in federal student loan debt per borrower for those making under $125,000 a year. He goes, and then he says, yet an educator interviewed won't vote because Biden didn't do it. Crazy. I, I mean, I, are people that dense? This notion that he didn't do it, he tried, he did, another equal branch of government said you can't do it. But they still have been able to cut a hundred and yes, it's one point six trillion dollars uh, in student loan debt out there. They've been able to cut one hundred twenty seven billion dollars. Please explain to me or show me where any Republican wants to get that done. So this idea that, oh, yeah, damn the hundred twenty seven billion and damn the three point nine million that, that were helped. Uh, it wasn't me. So he didn't do it. This is a particularly sore subject for me, considering I paid my student loans today, this morning. Um, I don't enjoy having to do that, but nonetheless, I'm blessed to be able to. But yeah, you're right. Look, I mean, it was the Supreme Court's decision, not um, Biden's, and they attempted, I think, valiantly to do that. But I think really we're having the wrong conversation when it comes to student loans. Student loans are always had in a conversation about, you know, basically some faux morality about you've made an agreement, you need to honor that agreement, so on and so forth. But it ticks me off when we talk about this because, you know, we subsidize farmers. We're the same people who talk about free market enterprise, but we find a way to fix prices so that some corn grower in Iowa doesn't lose their shirt on their corn harvest. Um, that, to me, is problematic because it seems like we're doing one thing and espousing another, but in a different scenario, we're handling it differently. So to that end, the uh, Biden administration did, in fact, try to uh, nix a lot of the student loans. And that was already a question. I think, Michael, you know, uh, laid it out perfectly. There is a check and balance and an executive order only has so much strength um, as it relates to things that can be done and that can't be done as it relates to what the Supreme Court decides to uphold. But the bigger thing is Congress needs to recognize that the cost of going to college is extraordinary these days. It balloons every year. And the fact that there's no price control on that is really the biggest determinant for this, because the reality is we live in a society now where having an education provides you a markedly greater opportunity um, than it does if you don't. That's just the reality. And that's what children are taught. And until Congress sees this more as an issue that I think energizes and helps your average American more than it does some faux moral question, we won't make meaningful progress on that despite what the administration does, because this has to be remedied through congressional legislation. And until that happens, we're going to have the same impasse and the same BS conversation that we continue to have about student loans. See, the, the, thing, from, the thing that drives me crazy, um, Joy, and it really bugs me, like, I, like I, it, it gets on my nerves when I hear these people go, Biden's done nothing for black people. And you go, nothing? I know. And it's sort of this absolutism. And, 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 and people are stuck on this. And then, like, for instance, I, I get a kick out of the, well, we ain't got no anti-black hate crime bill. Actually, there have been three. Yeah. <laughs> there have been three. And so this idea that, I mean, Civil Rights Act, 
It's actually an anti-black hate crime bill. The uh, James Byrd Act, mm, that was as well. The act that dealt with the burning of black churches, mm, that as well. And, and you have these people who say these things as if nothing has been done. And then this idea, like, in fact, I, I saw somebody the day, so Chuck Schumer uh, sent out a tweet uh, where he was talking about um, federal judges. And, um, and, and, and so he, his tweet was, uh, where is it, where is it? He was talking about uh, uh, judges that was confirmed. So this is the tweet here. Confirmed, Monica Almadani as district judge for the Central District of California and Brandon McMillan as district judge for the Eastern District of Michigan. With their confirmations, the Senate has now confirmed 50 black judges and over 100 people of color to the bench. And then people go, oh, well, judges don't matter. And you're like. <laughs> <laughs> judges are everything. Judges are everything. And sometimes I, I get so frustrated and I want to use the S word, stupid. But what I'm going to say is stupid. is stupid, like just brokenness, because there is no way that you could look and see what has stood in the way of progress has been our loss of the Supreme Court. And you, there's no way you can say that judges don't matter. Judges are everything. To our other guests, let me echo them. What the Supreme Court said was that Biden couldn't do it. So that says he was trying to. What they're saying is that Congress has the power to forgive these loans. Congress has the power to do even more long-term to try to stem the, the, the growth of student loans. Yes, right? and then, so you can't, then, you, then you can't complain about that if you don't vote, and so the Republicans Correct. take control of the House. Uh, look, so right now they have control of the House. Democrats control the Senate. They may very well, you know, Manchin's not running in West Virginia. If Democrats don't hold one of those seats, they may take control of the United States Senate. So guess what? Now it's going to be harder to confirm judges. So, right. and, 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 and I guess for me, I, what drives me nuts are people who don't understand the long game. It's the long game, Joy. And so if you focus on the long game, you know what? You may be able to achieve this in the first four years. But then the goal is to reelect to achieve this. But I can guarantee you, Trump gets in, you're achieving this. Matter of fact, you're losing ground. You're losing ground. You're not just not achieving what you wanted to, you're actually losing ground. And that goes to not just student loans, that goes to reproductive health, that goes to your views about Israel and Palestine and what's happening there. If you don't like it, trust me, the Republicans don't have anything for you in terms of that. They will make it worse as they did during the Trump presidency. So it's just factually incorrect. But it's also a reminder to all of us. We have got to educate our friends and family. They need to all watch Roland. Yes. But we also around the Thanksgiving table, you cannot allow this type of ignorance, misinformation um, to just go unchecked. So you gotta, I mean, you gotta bone up on your facts, your talking points, et cetera, and you have to challenge those loud voices in your family who can really suppress the vote. You have to say something to them. No, I'm sorry, I respect you, but I respectfully disagree, and here are the facts. If not, we are going to see further setbacks. And as you've noted before, look at their plans for 2025. They're trying to dismantle our democracy so that we can't fix it later. This is our chance and our moment to save our country and make it what it's not, but what it could be. Well, I, I, I just would like for people to make an attempt to actually understand Civics 101. It would be nice. 
It would be real nice. Coming up next, folks, we're going to talk about uh, speaking of what happens again when you execute a plan. Uh, we'll talk with uh, Virginia House Minority Leader, Delegate Don Scott, who come January will not be the minority leader. They now control the Virginia House. How did they do so against a governor who was sure he was going to take control of the House and the Senate and be able to run the table with his MAGA policies. That is next on Roller Martin Unfiltered, the Black Star Network. Please, folks, support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. Uh, and so senior check-in money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Take some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr, we welcome the Black Star Network's very own Roland Martin, who joins us to talk about his new book, White Fear How the Browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. The book explains so much about what we're going through in this country right now and how, as white people head toward becoming a racial minority, it's going to get, well, let's just say even more interesting. We are going to see more violence. We're going to see more vitriol because as each day passes, it's, it, it is a nail in that coffin. The one and only Roland Martin on the next Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, inflation is on the rise. Interest rates are high. Can you still thrive during these uncertain times? On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to meet a woman who's done just that, living proof of what you need to do to flourish during these uncertain times. These are times where you take advantage of what's going on. This is how people get rich or richer. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, we have Brio, performance artist and author, writer, singer, and composer, Queen Mother, Nana Camille Yarbrough. Please join us for an incredible conversation of knowledge, wisdom, and power of the elders. I'm a perception changer. You're a rearranger. You're a mind evolver and a problem solver. You're a beast eater, a soul excreter, a void filler and a bile spiller. You are a thought warmer, a plan former, a power orchestrator, and a tongue translator. Right here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. And you're watching Roland Martin. Night in Virginia, 
Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin, boy, he was sure that he was going to have uh, a trifecta. He thought that he was going to be able to have Republicans control the Senate. Democrats right now control the Senate. He already had the House. Uh, but what ended up happening? Didn't get the Senate, and Democrats took control of the House. It was a clear uh, plan uh, that was led by my next guest. Uh, it was one that people said, hey, I don't think you can raise the money. I don't think we can do these things. But he understood that if you put in the work, good things will happen. Joining us right now is Delegate Don Scott, uh, who is the Democrat House Minority Leader in Virginia. But that will change in a couple of months uh, because now that they control the chamber, uh, he will be the next Speaker of the House. Uh, Frank, glad to have you here. Uh, you, uh, you feel pretty good this week, huh? What can I be angry yeah, about? I'm, up, I'm happy. We're great. We're doing everything that we said we would do. Uh, I think sometimes people uh, underestimate us, and I, and I love that because that's my superpower, being underestimated. And so one of the things that you know, people do, you can, you can get a lot done when people don't think you're a real threat. And so I think what happened in this, this case, we were able, we were underestimated. Folks told me because... Uh, I guess I was a, a black man in this position for the first time that I wouldn't be able to raise the money. And I think Obama gave us the blueprint for that, that that's not true. We reach out, we do the work, we can raise, we can raise the resources because it's not about just race. It's also about ideas. It's about leadership. And I think we were able to, to put those things together, to get a plan, to put Virginia, uh, the, common, the, uh, the old capital of the Confederacy. Uh, now they're going to have a black man for, as a speaker for the first time in the history of this uh, great state. I, I was cracking up laughing because uh, Charlie Kirk, Republican, he was uh, all mad and upset uh, saying, uh, uh, Democrats, they outspent us by $8 million. Uh, Youngkin, even, uh, even Rona McDaniel admitted that Youngkin told them, hey, uh, hey, we don't need the RNC money. Uh, and, and now they're mad because they lost. Well, that, that's what happens when you underestimate people and you don't use all of the arrows in your quiver. We used every single thing. We overspent. We knew we needed to because Virginia is a purple state. People don't realize, but in the House of Delegates where I serve, uh, the Republicans have been in the majority for 22 of the last 24 years. Wow. So that is the cockiness that they come with, rightfully so. They've won 22 of the last 24 years. Well, so the cockiness of them, but also, let's just be honest, in many cases, the complacency of Democrats in not understanding how do you turn out your base. You have to turn out your base. You have to amplify your base. You have to continue to talk to your base, educate, advocate. And it can't just be during the election cycle. So I'm committed, after we do this, that next year in January, we'll be talking, we'll be having listening conversations as we continue to talk to our communities, all of our communities, not just the black community, but the entire Commonwealth, to talk to them about what we're doing. Uh, I heard you talking about, people say, well, what did they do? What did they not do anything? We're doing a lot. And we did a lot for the short time we had the majority. Mm -hmm. but. Nobody understands and knows, so we have to continue to communicate because we, Janet Jackson wrote a song about it, What Have You Done For Me Lately? And so that is the voters you have to continue to educate, otherwise it'll go backwards. I think the voters want normalcy again. They want, they believe in democracy. They don't want the mess that the Republicans have caused that they've seen them doing in D.C. They don't want it in Virginia. And I think uh, it was a clear repudiation of MAGA Republican politics as for, and Governor Youngkin is, I call him MAGA light. He tries to be MAGA light. He wants all of the benefits of MAGA, but he don't want to go as far as, as Trump. But I think they rejected MAGA and MAGA light, and they want back to normal, like the old school Republicans that just cared about national security, foreign policy, and economics, and not this uh, uh, veiled racism and, uh, and, and divisive culture war. I also fundamentally believe Democrats have got to learn how to take credit for stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at... Um, you know, for all of his craziness, Donald Trump was all about marketing. He took credit for stuff he didn't do. Right. He was running around taking credit for a bill that Obama had signed. Um, and what I've never understood with Democrats on the national level and the state level, they can pass things but are afraid to thump their chest. I, I keep telling people, politics is not just about legislating. 80% of politics is seizing the bully pulpit and said... We did that. That's right. We did that. We did that. And so when you imprint that on people's minds, they go, they did that. I 100% agree. I think Democrats are sometimes guilty of winning the debate, winning the argument, winning the policy, and losing on the politics. Not understanding, like, that was an election Tuesday, but my next election started Wednesday. 
And I think that's the messaging, that's the, the aggressiveness that we have to have to continue to win. We have to, we can't, there is no such thing as an off year. There's no such thing as next year. The next day, your communication begins. The next day, your messaging begins. The next day, you begin to talk to your voters again and get them refreshed. So when the time comes and you need them, they'll be there. But if we only come around when it's raining to ask for an umbrella, then that you're not going to get it. You have to always be there and be prepared, even when it's not raining, to ask for an umbrella. And I think that's what we, uh, the generation of leaders in Virginia now, being led by me, I believe you have to do that. I think you have to bring in uh, uh, diverse voices. You have to bring in representation. You have to bring in a little bit of everybody because the Democratic Party is a big tent party. We are the only party that really embodies the American dream, a multiracial, multiethnic, a multi-faith-based uh, political party, uh, including the LGBTQ community, including everybody. And I think we welcome that. And so we need to talk about that and own that and, and just oppose that with what the Republicans are doing, which is mainly just talking to one small segment, one small slice of, uh, of, of community. I've looked at um, I look at a lot of these national shows, and at that night it was driving me crazy because all of them were making the assumption that oh, Virginia was totally about abortion, but it, that wasn't the only issue folks were voting on. Not at all. I mean, you have to remember the governor's first thing, the first executive order he passed, his day one agenda, he called it, was to pass an executive order banning CRT. That offended a lot. Like, you don't want to teach our history. So people need to understand, like, it was not only that. It was banning, you know, attacking public education. You know, some people taught it, they called it one thing, but we saw it as you want to defund public education. And I think those messages resonated. He wanted to ban books. I mean, so when you start talking about that, when you start talking about he wanted to do a billion-dollar ongoing permanent tax cut for corporations that didn't ask for it and didn't need it. And so, and take it away from... With, with the state sitting on a massive yeah, surplus. With the state sitting on a massive pur surplus when we just had a report that said we've been massively underfunding our public schools. Who goes to public schools? So we had a lot of folks that said, hold on, what is this guy doing? He might be likable. He might be trump light. He doesn't even wear that red vest. He's likable, but we don't like his policies. So he can stay there, but we're going to get rid of his, his, uh, his side, his, side, his, uh, his co-conspirators. We're throwing them out, and we're going to start over. And I think that's what we've done. We have an opportunity to continue to build. Virginia is a very purple state. The way these new maps are drawn, it's very slim margins. The last election we lost, uh, we lost the majority by about 200 votes out of millions cast. And so this time we won the majority. Probably the two seats that made the difference was about 1,800 votes out of millions cast. Mm -hmm. You have to micro-slice, micro-target, talk to your voters, and then you got to spend a lot of money because if you don't spend it, they're going to bully you out. So you have to do it to keep up with the communication. So I think uh, we learned some lessons and we're going to continue to learn lessons. We gave the most money. I raised the most money in any minority leader in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. We gave the most money to our, direct to our candidates because we wanted candidates to be free to talk to voters, to knock doors, not to be doing call time, which is what you do normally when you run for office, always on the phone trying to raise money. We wanted to free them up for that, and we had our leadership team, led by me and others, to be able to bring in the resources to fund those campaigns. Um, and, and speaking of that, um, when you talked about how you have to speak to these areas in off years, um, I think uh, one that that's important. And like I am constantly saying on this show, in speeches and other places, that people look at elections the wrong way. People, we run out here and we go vote, 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 vote. And I'm like, folks, voting is the end of the process. Before you vote, you got to be registered. And then before you register, before you get registered, I've got to educate and enlighten you on why you need to get registered. And then, when you register, why you need to vote. And, and I think the, the, the thing that drives me crazy, and I'm going to say it, largely with these white Democratic strategists, they just want to dump the money on TV and radio and don't want to spend the time parsing the data, educating the voters, talking to them, connecting the dots, going through all of that, looking at the precincts, where the weaknesses are, let's send folks there to turn them out, is just think, oh, just run the ads, and that's going to solve it. No. And I believe Biden-Harris has to do the exact same thing. It's a bunch of people saying, oh, something get done. Then when you run it down, oh, we ain't know all that. So you got to, I believe they got to spend January to July really focusing on in educating and enlightening and then you get them to register and then vote. 
I mean, I think uh, President Obama made the blueprint for grassroots outreach before you do that, but you got to inspire people first. And I think we have to continue to educate, advocate, and inspire because you think about it, 1965, Voting Rights Act, that's the beginning of America as I see it. Right. That was the beginning of America. And if you think about it, you didn't have to tell black folk to go vote. We knew we was getting cracked in the head. We had to go vote. It, voting was a way of saving our lives right. and, and saving our children's future. So we have to go back and make people understand that just as it's not physically as hostile, they still killing you in, the fin in your pocketbook. They still yep. killing you in education. And so we have to continue to educate folks and we got to continue to educate all communities to let them know everybody has a stake in this. And I think a lot of white folks, when I talk to them, they, I, got, I got put in this position by, by, white, by you know, my white colleagues. It's not racial. They want, they want excellence, they want leadership, they want guidance, and they want, and they want fighters. And I think people want to see that in their leaders. And that's why Trump is so popular, because he's known to be a fighter. He's, he's doing those things. We may not agree with it, but he, they see him as their champion. Right. And at the end of the day, we need to match that same energy and have our own champions. Um, I, I, I often, I often talk about when black people, when we vote at a higher rate, we can sweep elections. Uh, of the five town halls we did uh, with you and the House uh, uh, Democrats on in Petersburg. And so that's a perfect example. Significant black population, go to my iPad, uh, but a Republican, Kim Taylor, won with re-election. Uh, she beat, beat Kimberly They haven't Polk called Adams. it yet. They haven't called it. They haven't called it yet? Yeah. So it was like, last I checked, she was up by 173 votes. Yeah. And when you look at the numbers, yeah. when you go through and look at, cause like you see this, you see this piece right here, mm -hmm. this is richmond.com. Uh, they said in here, Taylor, small business owner, was first elected to the house. Uh, said both parties thought they had a good chance in the contest because of geography. Adams had a strong hold in the city of P Petersburg while Taylor ran strong in rural uh, Dinwiddie and Prince George's County. Here's the deal. You only have a strong hold if they turn out. They and the reality not. is did black folks in Petersburg did not. did not turn out. What was the number? 30 percent. If they come to 34 percent, because that is the largest. There are several localities in that district. Dinwiddie, Surrey County, Prince George County, and Petersburg. The largest part of that dis district is Petersburg, and they had the lowest voter turnout. So because <laughs> See, of that, right. and because of that, she lost. If you look at it on paper, it's, you look at it on paper, you're like, there's no way a, a auditor, a professional from Dinwiddie we could lose that race. Her HBCU son, graduate. School, HBCU graduate. She went to Virginia Tech, but she works at, at v Got it, got she, it. Works at Virginia it. Tech. But she is an outstanding candidate. I mean, she's, she started, she is the, she finished as the best candidate in our field. No doubt about it. And she could not pull it off because, and we, 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 we did everything by the book, but it's something about not talking to voters all the time. You got to talk to them all the time. And, and we, what, and and what we talked to them for about a year, and that still wasn't enough. So what happened here, uh, you get a Republican who won last time. Mm -hmm, her. Okay. Rural folks turned out. They turned out. And, and what I keep saying, I keep, I keep saying this to black folks, you can yell, holler, and scream mm -hmm. about them being in charge, but their people are going to vote. And if we have the numbers on our side, all we got, if, if 200 people had actually voted out of thousands in Petersburg, this black woman is the House delegate. Absolutely. It's, that, it's just that simple. I mean, I, it's hard to, you know, they could have went to the barbershop that day and got enough votes to all the barbershops in Petersburg and turned out and won. I mean, and part of the thing is we have to continue to just to talk to these voters because I think what's happening is in Petersburg and, and we have to talk to them because, and we have to be able to deliver. One of the things about a, a lot of communities like Petersburg that are black, they just don't see a difference being made. And they see people doing a lot of lip service. So we, we're going to make investments, not only with conversation, but with resources. And I think if we do that, then they'll deliver. If we can, take, if we can give them what they need and take credit for it, because they've been neglected over time historically. And so we can do some things to help Petersburg. That's what we want to do. All right, hold tight one second. Don, we're going to go to a break. We're going to come back. Uh, our panel gets to ask you some questions as well. Folks, we're talking with Virginia uh, House Minority Leader, uh, Delegate Don Scott, only for a couple of more months uh, because by, by Democrats taking control of the House, winning it on Tuesday, he will become the next Speaker of the House in Virginia, the first African-American Speaker of the House uh, in Virginia history, only the second African-American Speaker of the House of a state house uh, in the South. 
That's huge, folks. We'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Blackstone Network. business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepherd Talk Show. This is your boy, Earthquake. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. We're chatting with Virginia House Delegate Don Scott. He is the uh, Democrats' minority leader. For now, after their success on Tuesday, uh, taking control of the House, he is going to become the Speaker of the House uh, when the new legislature uh, it convenes in January. Questions from our panel. I'll start with you first, Joy. Speaker-elect Scott, we need you in D.C. <laughs> I don't want to know all of your private conversations, but I hope you are talking to the DNC, the DSCC, the DCCC, and the White House. Now, let me ask you a question. You've talked about your Get Out the Vote campaign, but not just that, really starting from the beginning. If you are a candidate running for office, what do you need to be doing today? Give them a concrete example. The first thing you have to do, I believe, is you have to have, I think a lot of people run for office because they, some people in local communities, they just want the title, unfortunately. We need people to come in who have a heart for service. You have to love this, and, and the empathy has to be there to be a, a great servant. From that, then, you're going to do the community work. You're going to do the outreach. Uh, in whatever community, black, white, Latino, doesn't matter, you're going to do the outreach to your community to make sure they know who you are, know where you stand. You're going to educate yourself on the issues. I can tell you this is a true story. I've had people get elected and didn't know they had to live in Richmond for a couple of months while they were serving. They thought they could go home every day. I mean, they thought they didn't even have to come to Richmond. They could serve from home. No joke. And so I think you need to know what you're getting into, understand the job. The first thing that I did when I got elected, I've only been elected, I'll finish my fourth year in service and, my, and I'll begin my third term in January. And I used to look on YouTube, I used to do all of the, look at the arguments, look at the debates, look at the format, because I like to be right. And so I know a lot of people come into this not understanding what they're getting in themselves into, don't understand the time sacrifice. You have to know you're going to make a lot of sacrifice from your time and your family. You have to have your family support. I don't know what you believe in, your higher power, but you got to have some faith in God and some spiritual. That's what I think that sustains you, because it allows you to face adversity. I've been blessed to be able to face adversity. Some people have never faced adversity, so when some comes along, they pushed over and they can't survive. I think when you're in politics, you have to have a thick skin. They're gonna call you everything but a child of God. 
Just be ready for it. And, th and those are some of the first tips that I would tell people. Don't get into this if you're going to be a shrinking violet because it's difficult because you're going to have to, you're going to stand up for yourself because you uh, have to stand up for the folks that put you in this position. Michael. Amen. Michael. Okay. Yeah. All right, Delegate Don Scott. Uh, congratulations on this. I was watching returns on Tuesday night. Um, you started talking about some of the key issues that resonated with African Americans, book bans and suppressing the teaching of African American history, things like this. But I, I wanted to drill down more on that. What role did African Americans play in delivering the um, House, uh, the State House of Representatives to? Uh, Democrats and like what was the percentage turnout or any information you could provide on that and more specifically how did you message to African Americans to <laughs> get them to turn out and vote? You know this governor made it really easy to message I'm gonna start with that <laughs> because that's how bad he was and how incompetent he was uh, one of the things that he did at the very end was that he uh, purged voters from the rolls and didn't know, originally he said it was 270 voters that had been pur purged, and then a couple of weeks later they said it was over 3,000 people that had been purged. Now I just told y'all the numbers of how close these elections were. We won the majority in two races by about 1,800 votes. If you purge right. 3,000 voters in the right place, you can throw a whole election in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so right. I think voters repelled against that, they rebelled against that. It, it really angered some people that they were trying to steal this sacred franchise. And I think that was one of the things that turned out black voters and voters generally. I think a lot of times people think black people want something different than, than white people. We all want the same thing. You know, Maslow's theory, you know, safety, security, food, shelter. Then you can start, you know, trying to mm -hmm. self-actualize. But we all share those same things. We want to be safe in our communities just like they, you know, just like white people. We all have basic same human dignity needs. And so the difference is sometimes we speak a different language and culture. And the difference is we start from different places sometimes. The governor took out the word equity. We created a statute that said you're going to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. He said we don't need equity. We just call it a diversity, opportunity, and inclusion. And so he didn't fill the mandate of the statute. He never filled the position. He put in a guy to fill this uh, fake position, who a black guy who had worked at Chick-fil-A the year before. He literally had been a manager at Chick-fil-A. He made it really easy to communicate to black people about how incompetent he was and how much he did not really care about their issues. When you talk about what black voters, what black voters and what black delegates did to get us the majority, the 51st vote for me, the late, the race that they called last was a black man named Michael Fagans. He's a retired okay. master sergeant, my frat brother as well, retired master sergeant in Virginia Beach. He became the 51st <coughs> voter. He is not in a majority black district. He is a black man who can talk to anybody. And I think what we have to take away from this election is that people want leadership no matter what the package outside looks like. If you share their right. values, you speak to their issues, they will vote for you. We have 30 new members of the, we're gonna have 30 members total in the Black Caucus. Out of 140 people, we're gonna have 30 of those seats between the House and the Senate. So black people and white people are seeing that black leaders and black people are ready to lead. Right. Okay. I will hold it against you that you're alpha. I'm still glad you won. I, Hell, saw, I you... saw that stuff on your thing. I wasn't going to say nothing about it because I, I feel sorry <laughs> for people. I feel sorry for some people. My mama taught me to be polite. <laughs> you, you can't hold it against them. That's alpha and everybody else. I don't know why our little, our little brothers and sisters get so angry sometimes. <laughs> Who? Our little brothers, our little brothers from the other organization. No, nah, I call my children. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't no, want to no. do them that bad. My little. Brother. I do. I do. I call them children. I tell him, who's your daddy? Matt, your question. Well, first, let me say, we need you in Texas, not in D.C., brother, so congratulations. Well, he's actually from, he's actually from, uh, from uh, Houston. Uh, he, went, he went to uh, an inferior high school called Sterling. Oh, watch it, 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 boy. It ain't stop Jack, it. you know it stop ain't Jack it. Gates. Stop it, boy. You know, y'all ain't won nothing. We, we, want, we won some things. Where, where, where's Zena Garrison from? Y'all ain't won where nothing. Where's Clyde Drexler from? That's two. Okay, I can keep going. Where's Debbie okay. Allen from? Okay. Well, Felicia Rashad from. They sisters. You can't count them. They That's have a no choice. That's Boy, don't even start. <laughs> don't even start. Go. Go ahead, Matt. Well, here's a question. Where did Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad go to school? That's the real question. Jack Yates High School. He talking about In Howard. Any, 
Yeah, yeah and but, Howard University. Yeah, yeah, but but if they don't do it right at Yates, they not doing well at Howard. Nice try, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> now go and ask your little question. As usual, I'm focused on the facts and the questions here. If you would, Brother Scott, what is your legislative agenda going forward? Because I know Yunkin is out, I guess, next year. You've got uh, a majority in both. So whatever you send to his desk, I mean, you can basically veto his veto. So I'm, I'm interested in what you're expecting the primary issues to be for the legislative agenda and specifically if you think there will be any constitutional amendments on issues that we're seeing in the in the you know national zeitgeist things like qualified immunity uh crt abortion anything else that might be um looking at constitutionally amending uh those issues thank thank you very much yeah you can expect i'm gonna start with that at the beginning um you can expect to see a constitutional amendment to make sure that we protect women's reproductive health care uh, that will happen you will see a constitutional amendment for automatic restoration of rights I don't know if you know, but in Virginia, it's one of the only states, uh, I think Kentucky may do it, but Virginia permanently disenfranchises folks who have a felony conviction. And so, and the governor has uh, been very, very slow in restoring rights. He changed the entire process and made it w much more difficult and, much, and created much more barriers, many more barriers to prevent people from having their rights restored. So you're going to see a constitutional amendment for automatic restoration of rights. We don't believe the governor should have the ability to keep people from being restored to their full American citizenship and being able to make, be made whole in their communities, especially if they're paying taxes and contributing to the community. And so, with we, you know, this governor has taken us backwards on that particular issue, and we're going to try to go forward. I don't know if you know, but Virginia is one of the uh, states that put uh, the ban on gay marriage in the Constitution. So if the Supreme Court were to overturn gay marriage, it would be Im immediately illegal in Virginia. So we want to introduce a constitutional amendment to take that out and so those are three of the top priorities that I can think of as far as constitutional amendments. But as far as the policy prescriptions that we have uh, for Virginia, we want to make sure that, you know, because we're so close, we're 51-49 in the House, and in the Senate we have a majority, Democratic majority of 21-19. And so at the end of the day, and we have a Republican governor. So we're going to have to make some compromises to get some things done. And I think that's what the voters said. The voters said, we're going to reject this mess that looks like chaos that the Republicans are doing, and we want the adults in the room to sit down and talk again. And I think if you take away the extremes of the MAGA Republicans, we'll be able to come to some agreements on funding public education. That's a priority. Making sure we have great economic development with equity and fairness for everybody, giving everybody economic opportunity. I think we can agree that AK-47s probably shouldn't be on our streets. Uh, we can agree on that. I think we can agree that we should be strengthening our red flag laws so that people with mental health issues uh, could have uh, access and have those guns removed. One of the things that we saw last session was every single Republican in the House of Delegates voted to repeal red flag laws that allow folks to take a, a firearm away from people who are in a mental health crisis. Who does that? And so I think common sense has to prevail. I think Democrats are on the right side of these issues. You know, we're in the middle. We're in the, cent in the center on all of these issues. The Republicans are on the stream. We're in the center on reproductive health care. We're in the center on gun violence prevention. We're in the center on economic opportunity for all. We're in the center on making sure that we fund public education. So if we continue to do those things and stay focused on the, on the job at hand, I believe that we're going to make the governor sign some bills, do some things that most MAGA Republicans wouldn't do, because if he rejects it, then they'll pay again in 25. Last question I have for you. Um... You obviously see poll numbers, uh, national. <clears throat> Coming on the heels of this week, what advice do you have for the Biden-Harris campaign when it comes to um, really trying to speak to the needs of the voters in order to win the re-election? I think they're going to have to do, they're going to have to get rid of the window dressing. I think we do a lot of window dressing, and you're going to have to drill down and really start talking to voters about the things, everyday kitchen table issues. One of the things that people, people, you know, unfortunately, I know we want to think that this is all philanthropic and everything, but we some selfish things. And so we want to know what's in it for us. And I think we got to start telling people what's in it for us. Uh, I think the theme that the, that the president is talking about, about saving democracy, I think that's real. I think there are a lot of people who are afraid that if Trump comes back, not only is he going to make it worse, he's even said it already, he's going to get some payback. 
Yeah. Oh, he said, I'm going to use the IRS, the DOJ against my enemies. He has said, I will suspend, I believe we should suspend the Constitution. I heard somebody talking about the Constitution earlier. (laughs) Dude, you can't do that. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're continuing to educate people. And people react sometimes, you know, on their, if we we inspire people, give them that hope, and also remind them of what happens if you don't. And I think they have done so much. The CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, the job, they've created so many manufacturing jobs and new manufacturing. They have to have a very, very sustained, because some people just don't want to hear it. Right. And it's amazing, but you got to keep, me- I hate it myself. I stayed on message so much. I had my team and my, and my members who were running. I know they probably were mad at me because I was like, here is your box. Here is your message box. You leave this box, you should feel that zap. All right, you stay on message. And I think if we all stay on message and the president and his team, they're smarter than I am, but if they stay on message, they can win this election. Because they got a crazy person that likes chaos. And if they stay on message, I think, and continue to be the grown-ups in the room, I think they win this election. It's called voting on sanity. That's all it is. That's what it is. That's all it is. It's easy. All right, Delegate Don Scott, we appreciate it. Uh, Look forward to uh, you being sworn in as a speaker. You're going to be there in January, baby. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be be there hanging out. I'm sure you you have a bigger smile on your face then. Uh, And I'm sure, uh, sorry, my alpha will be represented in the house. That's how we do it. All right, appreciate it. Thanks so much. (laughs) Take care. All right, folks, uh, coming up next. We'll chat with uh, director, actor, also author, Eric LaSalle. Y'all know from ER. Well, he's got a new book out, so we'll chat about uh, what he's doing with his literary talents. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, you can watch our 24-hour streaming channel on Amazon News. Just simply go to Amazon News and go to Amazon Fire. Check out Amazon News. You can tell Alexa to play news from the Black Star Network. Uh, also, Plex TV. You can see us there as well. Also, Amazon Freebie. And you can check us out on Amazon Prime Video as well. We'll be right back. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program, or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high-growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me?
My next guest, you remember him, folks, uh, hit series ER. ER, that's right. Uh, he uh, was on that course, also from Coming to America. These days, uh, he stays busy being a director, executive producer. But did you know that Eric LaSalle is also an author? His newest book is called The Laws of Annihilation. It was just released. He joins us now from Los Angeles. Eric, what's happening, man? What's up, Roland? How you doing, brother? Man, good to see you. Good to chat with you. Uh, first of all, uh, it was a few years ago. It was a few years ago, uh, you and I were texting back and forth, and, and you were self-publishing, and you were really just starting into it. So uh, you, how many books are you into now? This is the third book in the uh, series. Got it. Uh, and I'm working on, I just finished up the fourth one. I'm working on the fifth one now. Uh, so I just want to, you know, keep doing it. Um, it's, uh, it took a long time, you know. Um, I was, you know, trying to get published, couldn't get a publisher for several years. And then uh, finally... Uh, got a good publisher, and they republished the ones that were self-published. This one has never been published. This is a brand new book. Uh, but the funny thing is, you know, all those books that weren't published, um, you know, by a publisher traditionally, uh, now, you know, we're making a bestsellers list, and we're making um, all three of the books. Um, I, I actually pulled off a trifecta of being number one, two, and three, uh, on a few bestsellers lists. So I, I say that to really say that, you know, sometimes you can't listen to people. <laughs> you know oh, I mean? yeah. People are, you know, when people are trying to tell you, no, 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 there's no value, there's no value. Um, and particularly the interesting thing is the first two books weren't changed. They were still, you know, right. it's pretty the same thing that was rejected. And now, you know, you're, you know, making a bestsellers list. So, uh, you know, the message, man, is just when you believe in something, yep. just keep because I, 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 I remember we were talking because uh, I have I've 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 self published five books, and uh, and, and my whole deal always was uh, and I remember meeting with a book publisher. Uh, this probably was about two thousand nine, two thousand ten. It was so funny, uh, and um, and they they asked to meet with me, and and I threw out four or five different things, and um, they were like, well, no, no, no. And probably by the fourth, no, I said, whoa, whoa. So let me help y'all out. I don't need y'all <laughs> to do any of these. Right. I said, let me be perfectly clear. I said, these books are going to get published. Right. I don't need you to do it. I said, now, you're talking to me as the author. I can take my hat off and then put the CEO hat on, and we can start talking about uh, paperweight and matte, hardcover, glossy, I start breaking down. I said, now, I said, let me be real clear. Because I was CNN, I was TV1, I was Time Drone. I said, I don't need y'all for media. And, and, and the reason that was important because so many people, I hear these people say, oh, I got rejected 30 times. But we're now living in a world where that, where you don't, that whole infrastructure that they, is so critically important, you don't actually need. The key is, Get your work out there and right. work it and put it in the hands of people and they will, they like it, they'll consume it. Well, you know, look, technology has liberated us in a lot of ways. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, you look, think about it. You can now make, you know, I started off when I became a director, I, you know, started off, you know, shooting short films. You know, you have to go and rent all this equipment. I mean, you know, that was years ago. I mean, I've been directing for 20 years uh, in that time, you can do, you can make a movie on an iPhone now. Like, dude, you know dude, I mean? M Matthew uh, Cherry did a movie on an iPhone 6. Steven Soderbergh has done several movies on an iPhone 7. Uh, hell, we ain't talking about the iPhone 15, uh, right. but it's all about do it. Stop do it. waiting for somebody to give you permission. Exactly. And that's, you know, and that's the thing that, you know, there, there are options. I was determined, like you, I was determined I wasn't going to let no, you know, and I, I got, I got 30, 40 rejections. You know what I mean? I mean, dude, I was, I was getting multiple rejections from the same publishing house. Cause you wow. know, you go, Oh, well, let's try this person. Let's try this. Oh, we know this one in it. And you know, and then I brought the second book. So, but the point is like you, I was determined that this was going to, you know, this was going to get out there. So I, so I self published what that did was that started generating interest. Cause we did well as a self published book. 
um, got really good reviews. Um, so it, it unfortunately, we had to validate, you know, we needed validation. And a lot of times, you know, it's easier for some people, but this was just a part of the journey. So I don't complain about it. I just roll up my sleeves. I do it. And, and this is also something really important, you know, when we talk to and try to message to young people is double down on the effort. You know what I mean? Like yep. you, you, you have the choice to take that rejection and let it die right there. Like that's it. That's that, that's, I'm not going to do anything. Or you can use that rejection yep. to be inspired and go, I'm going to double. I'm, you know what I did when I got rejected? I wrote the second, I was like, I'm going to write again. Mm. And then I'm going to write again. And one of these is going to break. And so now the cool thing is, um, you know, now with the laws of annihilation coming out, like I said, all the books are selling. So I knew yeah. there was, there was that, that this franchise. And so people read the first book. Now they want to read the second and third or people read the third book. Now they're going back saying, mm-hmm. oh, I got to check out the first two books. So that's, and, you know, and that's, that's really important. And I think when we're trying to create, I started writing for self-empowerment for, to, you know, you want to own IP, you want ownership. And that's what, there you go. Color, that's what we have to do. So it's, it's in a weird way. It's bigger than our individual um, goals. It's like if we, you know, because they don't even, there aren't that many African-American writers in the, in the genre of thrillers, which is what I write. And so we're trying to change that as well. So yep. like I said, it's cool to be a part of something that's even a little bigger than your ego and your, 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 your goals. And, you know, we all have them, but I also like being a part of showing, Hey, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to empower ourselves even more, uh, you know, great business sense, you know, great structure, um, to create the success, uh, because we, we, I, I created these books to, I uh, wanted to make a successful literary franchise mm-hmm. that then turns into a successful film streaming television. There you go. Franchise. So that's ownership. And that, and then it becomes, that's the, that's the power. Uh, we're not going and begging people, Hey, come look at this script. Look at this. We're not doing it right. the traditional way. We're doing it another way. It's interesting. Uh, cause I, I know somebody's watching going, Whoa, well, hold up. How can you be Eric LaSalle, a prominent actor on a hit show And they tell you no. Well, guess what? Same thing happened with Hill Harper when he did his book. Uh, And they were sitting here, and and he was literally told, oh, black men don't read. And he was kind of like, yeah, they do. Uh, And that ended up turning into, uh, you know, a a trilogy of books. And but but it also comes down to motive in terms of what it is that you want in terms. And so, like, for me, like, so, so my book out now called White Fear the only reason I did that with the publisher is because I met the sister. Uh, I met the sister. Um, I met a woman uh, at Emmett Smith's golf tournament who was a literary agent. And we sat next to each other, and she, she asked me several different things. She's like, oh, my God, I love that. She says, I want to rep that. And I was kind of like, okay. I mean, I, so I wasn't necessarily interested. So I said, let's go ahead and do it. And it was, and it, it was a trip, though, because it was like this three-year process same thing. No, no, no. And I was sitting here like, uh, Jan, I don't need them to say yes. <laughs> because I knew about my social media following, had my own show, do my own stuff on radio. I knew I'm going to move 20 plus thousand copies of the book. Bring it here. I know I'm going to move 20,000 copies of the book. So I wasn't even sweating that. And, and I remember with my, 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 I think my second book, I was talking to this uh, sister. She was on the New York Times bestseller list, and she was asking me about my book. I said, yeah, let's do our third printing. And she was like, okay. And then I told her, I said, yeah, I said, we generated probably about 35000 And she said, I ain't seen one royalty check. I said, well, the beauty of self-publishing, when you sit there signing books and it's your square, uh, the money going right into your bank account. And we had this huge laugh. But again... I just tell people, do not allow them to control your creative output. Right. And when you do that, then you're stifled and you think you aren't worthy when the audience is out there. And if you work it, you'll move some copies. Exactly. And that's, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's like I said, it's, it's really cool. There's a brother by the name of S.A. Cosby, um, who is, has set the literary world on fire and he writes in this genre. Uh, obviously, we have the uh, the godfather, uh, Walter Mosley. Yeah, uh, we I'm a part of the uh, 
uh, crime writers of color or organization. And you know, we've got sisters, we've got brothers that are doing it. Um, but again, there's the perception in the publishing industry, which is which is a very broken industry. So yeah, it's, it's it's insane how broken it is. But um, you know, they keep churning things out. But we have this talent. And, um, and, you know, we just have to keep pushing and we, we end up selling books and what, see what they won't tell you, the 35,000 books that you, that you pushed, they have invested, um, millions of dollars into some writers that don't look like us and they're not pushing 35 and they have a huge machine behind them. Right, right. <laughs> they don't. They don't tell. They don't tell that part of it. Right. So you have to. That's why I'm saying you can't. You know, they, like there's a whole campaign. There's this. There's all this. They spend a lot of money, and a lot of these books are not selling. Yes. And, well, uh, well, well. I, I think because the public doesn't. The public really doesn't understand. I mean, they'll see Michelle Obama's book. You know, eight million copies or something along those lines. Not realizing the average book that's being put out, and by, right. even by the Random Houses yes. and the St. Martin Press, yeah. they ain't moving 10,000 copies. Exactly. And people, and people, don't, under, people don't get that. Their, their, billion, their, build, their, their business is a volume business. We're going to put out 200 books or whatever the number is. It's a volume thing, and I think that's where people get so frustrated uh, and they just don't understand of that process, Victoria Rao, when her book came out, was so interesting, Eric. So she did the book with a pu publishing company, and basically they gave her a PR person for like two months. Right. And then after that, yo, they right. booked. And so right. her book came off the New York Times bestseller list. So what Victoria then did was, she was like, oh, hold up. So she then, understanding the biz, she, she got her own photographer, her own PR person, began to book her own radio interviews, mm -hmm. and then guess what? went back on the New York Times bestseller list. So the publisher called, she was like, oh, no, we good, we good. Right. You know, because she under, she, and then what that meant was she was creating her own database right. of media outlets. So when for her next book, she's like, I'm not waiting on y'all. And so this is where I'm always trying to explain to people, understand the business of the business and exactly. don't get enamored with the show in oh, show business. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's that's why we're so easily shut down, because we don't know and, and, and they mislead. And so I like I said, I, I love the first of all, I love writing. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller, so I love so I, I have the passion for that. But you're absolutely right. You have to marry that because many of us are artists, many of us, even as athletes, many of us are, uh, you know, rappers, whatever. But when you start understanding ownership. When you yes. start understanding the business more. Like, you know, I remember when, you know, Prince went through his thing. Yeah. He started understanding the business more. Michael Jackson started understanding the business. So he said, I'm going to go buy the Beatles catalog. So, and that, that was insane. So, you know, so it was thought, but look how profitable it was. So the more we understand the business, the more it can service our art. Because we leave from a place of, I'm an artist. I love right. art. I love, I would do this for free, but we got to understand the business. So I'm, I'm getting an education, but I also maintain the there you go. joy of being an artist and, and creating this, fran this, this is a cool franchise. I love, I love the characters. People or, you know, the reviews on it are, are crazy and, 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 uh, and people get it. And so had I given up, I wouldn't have had that quote unquote validation. I wouldn't have been, you know, making yep. the bestsellers lists. I wouldn't be moving books. I wouldn't be right, wait, work, you know, working on my fourth book and my fifth book. So, you know, the message here is, you know, yes, be the artist, be in love with the art but also understand enough of the business to protect the art. Yep. And that's something that, no, I, I, it took me years to learn that. I don't know how long it took you. It took me a while uh, to learn it. Well, the, in love I, with the artist. well, I'll be honest. I had the advantage of a grandmother owning a catering business that I started with when I was seven. Mm. My mom had her own cake business. Um, and so I actually understood the business of the business as a teenager. Right. And so when I came into media, I literally, I went to communications high school, Jack Cates High School in Houston. 
uh, it was magnet school. And I was literally at 15 understanding, owning, controlling the narrative. And never forget the first day, sophomores, years, second semester, we couldn't go into the studio the first semester because we needed to learn the glossary terms, the ca- right. what a ca- what all different cables and stuff. So we go into the st- go into the studio. All students rush to the set, and Mary Waits was my uh, teacher. And I turned to her and I said, "Where does a person sit who tells them what to do?" <laughs> and she said, "That person sits in the control room." I said, "I'll be in the control room." And that was always my deal. And I never, I, 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 I won't say I did not get along with my bosses, but every place where I worked, I was weird to them because I wasn't about them controlling and owning all of my voice. Oh, you don't want me to write columns? Cool, I'm gonna go write it over here. Oh, I can't do this over here, I'm gonna do it over here. And And so for me, the two words that have completely guided everything in my life since I graduated in 1991 from Texas A&M was I wanted flexibility and freedom. Right. And I wasn't fixated on the money. And so for me, it's the the flexibility to do my craft and it's the freedom because you can pay me a lot, but the moment you say no, now I feel like I have a straight jacket on with handcuffs and um, and uh, and and uh, and tape, and I feel like muzzled. And so that's always sort of guided me. And 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 I, I've I've never tripped on. So it's like, yo, I'm not tripping. I, I didn't care about the New York Times bestseller list. I was like, so if I if I own this and I move fifteen thousand copies, I'm good. Like even with my book White Fear, I did it with a publisher. I didn't put together a thirty city tour. I know the cost of that. So I said, we're going to do cities where I have speeches. So I'm right. already going there. So I was, because I understood the business of the business. And, and when you understand the business part, it just totally right. changes your worldview in all of this. Uh, it's liberate, you know, it's liberation. And that's the thing that I, you know, and I, I, I started writing, um, you know, when I started becoming a director, I, started writing short films and then you know then at some point I said I, I want to try my hand at um, being a novelist and and I understood then I was like ownership and I've been preaching that you know since the days of ER um, which is why I you know started a production company started yeah. things because, and everybody watching I want y'all to understand literally this was like seven or eight years ago when Eric sent me a text and we were going back and forth about this very thing yeah 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 yeah. So now, you know, now I've got this, you know, this this really, really cool franchise. And and it's interesting because, you know, the kind of stories that I'm interested in, in telling. What, you know, what, what ends up happening is when you're waiting on validation and you're waiting for permission, um, you're waiting on them to approve your heart. Boom. And so and so my thing is like, no, I'm going to leave with my heart. I'm going to leave with my mind of of what, what I'm passionate about. And so I started telling the kind of stories I wanted to tell. And the interesting thing about um, Laws of Annihilation, um, it the subject matter is, um, it's about tensions between the African-American community and the Jewish community. Mm. Um, and and it deals a lot with racial hatred. It deals a lot with tribalism. Yeah, you say a race war is brewing in New York City and nobody can stop it. Exactly. And and we and you know so, and then of course now that when I start doing media, they start comparing to what's happening in the world right yep. now. And you know, look, just to, you know, but here's 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 like some of what see what I do is this. You know, you have to always take your advantages. So because of my film background, I'm always inspired by film. So my first book, Laws of Depravity, that was that that was influenced by the movie Seven. Mm. This book, Laws of Annihilation. Just a piece of it. You have a racist um, Jewish member of, uh, of the of Jewish member of the community, and you have an African American, a racist African American, that are locked in a uh, basement. They've been kidnapped. <laughs> they have every reason to want to kill each other, and they have to figure it out. Uh, you know, there for their survival. And so you take that and you take that as a microcosm and a metaphor of what's happening in the world. We have to figure this stuff out. That sounded but, like that. What was that uh, 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 Lawrence Fishburne movie where he was uh, in, Black, j- in jail Black. 
And it was like he had to get with the cops. He's like, listen, we either gonna die or we gonna put this thing together. But also this um the um um, um, was it the Sydney Port? Was it Sydney Port? Sydney Portier and Tony Curtis. Yeah, defiant ones. Yeah, and that's and so we have so we have these now, that, and that's the that's the B storyline. The A storyline is we open up with uh, two rabbis that have been viciously murdered, and so I have three protagonists in my books. Uh, one is um, like like seven, the same setup as seven. You have a Irish Italian American detective who's um, partnered with an African American detective in New York. They're considered the best closers. They close all the cases. They only work high profile serial killers, and so they team up with a half Jewish female FBI agent. So the three of them are my protagonists. So each book, they get to deal with their own personal things. So obviously in this book, you have a Jewish FBI agent who, by the way, in the first chapter, is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, And just as she's starting to deal with that, the biggest case of her career and of her life falls in her lap, which is... um, Two rabbis are viciously murdered in a synagogue, and then African American man is kidnapped, a Jewish man is kidnapped, and it's just stoking all the fires. And 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 so, in order to stop this war, they all have to work together. And it's just you know, so that's really you know really cool. And, and so I, I get a lot of you know conversations now about what's happening in the world. You know what I mean? And so, had I listened um, to the rejections. Mm. Uh, a, you and I wouldn't be here. This yes, book sir. wouldn't be here. And, and a book that resonates. And, you know, I, I like to write about things that, that resonate, that stick with you, that give you some really interesting characters and plot to hold on to. Because, you know, the truth is a lot of these books and what you and I were talking about earlier, a lot of these big publishing house books, you know, book, books that's published, you know, traditionally and these big authors sometimes, you know, Roland, you read these books and... I'm, you know, a week later, you can't remember. You can't remember characters. Can't, it didn't stick. It was just, it was just fluff. It was just fluff. But they're paying all this money. They're spending all this yeah. money. And and so I, you know, the thing that, uh, and I always, I urge, you know, people that's interested in the book, go to Amazon, read the reviews, you know, um, see what people are saying about it because. It's the, they always talk about how much it sticks with them. They talk about how fast paced it is. They talk about these things. But these are things that they were saying we couldn't do. They yep. were saying that there was no place for African Americans in this genre. And we're going, no, not only is there room, there is necessity based on how we tell story. And so that's something to me that's really, really important. And I think that we need to. That's why we need to follow our dream, because we need to contribute into the storytelling. We need to have control over our stories. We need to have control over how we tell stories. And so that's what these books are about. That's what this franchise is about. And I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm really, really proud of it. Um, I just think it's a, a, you know, it's been a great opportunity for me. And it's been something that um, really has uh, helped me to sort of to grow as a director, as an actor, as an a producer, because it's all storytelling and mm-hmm. it all feeds, they all feed each other. So, yeah, I'm really, really happy with that. Uh, quick questions from my panel. Let's see here. Uh, Joy, you got all them damn books behind you. I guess I'll go ahead and start with yeah. you. <laughs> so, I am a crime, true crime fanatic. I mean, I okay. listen to the podcast Crime Junkies all the time. They need to plug your books, separate thing. We'll talk about that later. So I'm tempted. I, I want to know what I want people to know. I just ordered it. I want Thank people you. to know what the story is about. That said, I also want to talk a little bit about how we diversify the publishing industry. Because you're right. We have to overcome. There is no excuse for not publishing, doing what you need to do. Right. But it also is a reminder of systemic racism why it's so important that we have to have diversity everywhere so we can tell our stories. So I don't know how you're gonna answer both of those questions. I wanna know what it's about, but I wanna know what we're gonna do to make it better for the next book authors. Well, they're, they're, you know, for me, they're, they're those, the answers are, are, are related. Uh, So like I said, so first of all, we have three protagonists. We have two New York City detectives, um, that end up teaming up with an FBI agent um, in pursuit of uh, high-profile serial killings. 
Um, so if you think of the movie Seven, very similar um, tonally in that direction. Um, each book, um, the first book, Laws of Depravity, um, focused on the Irish Italian American cop who used to be an who was an altar boy when he was growing up. He was molested by a priest. Okay, so the first case that we deal with. Someone, a serial killer, is killing falling priests that are pedophiles, etc. So he's torn because on one hand, he's a cop. On the other hand, he hates, you know, pedophiles. So there's an interesting dilemma. The second book focuses on our African-American detective uh, whose father was um, the godfather of Harlem. He was a, a notorious gangster who's now a legitimate businessman. But he did a lot of horrible things in the past, and some of that stuff comes back to haunt him. So that's the second book. The third book, we have a Jewish American um, FBI agent um, who, um, as, as all three of them now, are now investigating who's killing rabbis and who's kidnapping black people. Um, and you understand that, of course, there's some you know white supremacy at play that's playing us against each other. So you have these two interesting communities of uh you know, racism, uh, prejudice against um, African-Americans, prejudice against uh, and anti-Semitism against um, Jewish Americans. Uh, and so we have these two communities that have sort of been outside of the Native Americans, two historically of the most oppressed groups. And there's still tension between us. Um, and and so we have to figure out a way to work it out, and that's what the case is. And at the same time, our one of our leads, like I said, is diagnosed with uh, cancer. So now, how do how do we diversify? And the reason I say that these the the the, story, the, the answers are connected is because. We write with a certain flavor. We write with a certain voice. We write with a certain rhythm. We write with, that's how we open up. Like some of these stories that we read, it's the same old thing. It's the heroic white male doing the same thing. It's the, you know, and so I want to, I want to diversify, not just racially, but gender. I want to, I want to diversify things and show that, uh, you know, this female FBI agent is uh, written with the same, uh, you know, muscularity and, and alpha traits as my male uh, characters. So we want to show that women can be seen and carry books and uh, we can have these female heroes. We can have African-American heroes. We can have uh, white heroes. We can have Asian heroes, Latino Asians. We can have uh, heroes. We can have Native American heroes. So my books... Um, in the first book, you know, there's a Vietnamese uh, FBI agent. You don't see that kind of stuff a lot. So here's the key. Write your story. Write your story organically. I'm not trying to preach. If I tell the best story that I can tell, it just happens to be populated. My stories are populated with these colorful, diverse characters that becomes the validation. That becomes the way that we diversify because they start going, wow, these kinds of books with this uh, multiracial cast, multi-gender cast, um, not for the sake of preaching. And because when that stuff is forced, to me, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. Um, even if you have good intentions, it doesn't work. But when you read a book and it's just like, or you see a movie and it's naturally integrated into it, that's how we diversify because people start understanding. When I'm a producer, I used to think, uh, as a, I started as a director, I used to think that they didn't want us in certain roles. And a lot of that is true. But I also realized something, and it's similar to what Roland said about being in the booth, who sits in the booth. As a director, I would go and so they, they wrote a role is for a white male judge. Now, as a director, I'm now in a different room than I am as an actor. And, you know, and so I'm in the room with the producers, with the creators, and I say, well, wouldn't that be more interesting if that judge was an Asian female? Wouldn't that be more interesting if it was a man? And a lot of times, not all the times, and yes, there is definitely racism, hands down. A lot of times they would just go, oh, we never thought of that. So we need to be in these rooms that's the key thing. We need to get into the rooms or, and obviously when you write a book, you are the room. Um, but either way, we get to control the images that come out of the room that comes off of the, on the page. That's how we diversify. And that's how we show the industry that 
organic diversity works. And so they are connected. And that's why I took you through all my characters because they're so diverse and they each have different backgrounds. That's how, that's how we start breaking that barrier down. We have to make it work as a story and that translates into sales, that sales translates into success, that success translates into let's look at more of these. S.A. Cosby, you know, brother who has set the literary world on fire, um, I think is now beginning to help make people look at that again and say, oh, you know, black men can write, or black people of color can write thrillers. They they can't, you know, we're underrepresented in this genre. And uh, I'm happy to be a part of it to help try to tear down those walls. Um, but that's how I think we diversify. It's got to be quality first. It's got to yep. work. Your best intentions don't. It's got to be quality. Michael. Hey, Eric LaSalle, uh, on another note, hey, loved you on A Different World. 1990, wow. Power of the Pen. You played a literary professor named uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Mann. So here you are actually in real life writing literary, writing, writing literary works, three novels, okay? Is there a connection between you playing a professor of literature on a sitcom that all of us watched in the 90s and you actually writing uh, literature in real life? No, no. That was just, look, you know, when you're an actor and you, you got to think about it, that's the beginning of my career. When you're an actor, okay. agent calls you and says, I got an audition for you. You know, I was boys with Kadeem and Daryl. So, yes. You know, I was hanging out on that set anyway, just to go hang out, just to see them. Opportunity came up. I did that. What did influence me? Even more so was a few years later after ER, first after the first season of ER, some producers approached me and said, hey, we own the rights to this famous uh, novelist uh, series. Uh, we'd like you to play this character. Now, the guy is written white. So you had okay. my attention right there. And it was the book was called Mind Prey. The uh, author's name is John Sanford, who was huge in the thriller world, huge. And okay. so I said, well, fine, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I'll co-produce it. So I was a producer on it. I starred in it. Uh, I hired the director, um, who was my partner at the time. So once I got into that world, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I saw how the books translated into film. And I thought that was really cool. And that's what also pushed me. So that had more influence than anything, uh, being able to play this, this uh, famous a uh, key character that was established in the literary world as a, you know, he's written white and they came right. to me. And so as an African-American, and we never made, you, you never make mention of race. That's the beauty of it. If it's a good character, mm -hmm. we never mentioned that he was black. No one ever, you know, that's the beauty and that's the power. And that's what really got me interested. All right. Matt. Thank you so much. Well, let me first say, brother, thank you for sharing your gifts for these many years. And I, I would be, Remiss if I didn't say I've prosecuted and defended quite a number of murder cases. So if you ever need a consultant, I'm happy to do that for you. Right. As you write your <laughs> right uh, but all jokes aside, my question is really actually about the substantive process. You've obviously given us um, many works in, in different mediums, but what have you found that would be instructive to people who want to be authors? Because it seems to me that's a particularly daunting, you know, uh, gift to have to write because it's difficult to write a book, obviously. So what have you learned in that process that would help others who are interested in being authors? And if you could give us a quick encapsulation of your process when you're planning and writing and otherwise, you know, getting ready to release a book. Wow. Great, 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 great question. Um, you know, I think this, man, I think that it's important for us to have a, a strong sense of craft whatever you're going whatever you're going to do understand the craft of it too many of us jump into things whether it's acting whether it's broadcast what we just think we can show up and now I, I think it's becoming worse with social media because if you have so many followers then you know people are interested in you but they're not interested in you based on craft and not interested on based on you understanding the true technique of whatever you're pursuing so I think people want to be stars um, more I, I you know wrote Say something it. 
interesting. Um, I'm, I, I was never interested in being a star. I wanted to just be a, an actor. I wasn't. I didn't know about m- the money. I didn't know about any of. You learn that stuff later. Mm-hmm. I dreamed of being an actor, and and I was in love with the art of acting. I fell in love with the art of writing. Um, so I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to start writing. Um, obviously, you want to be successful, but you want to be successful. Um, you know, uh, critically, you want to be successful commercially. So that's what's really, really important. So I think it's, I think if people are serious about it, they have to learn the craft, go to, uh, first of all, which is something that's really simple, do homework. And most people, when you tell them to do homework, you lose them because people, people want it, but they don't want to put in the work. So if you're willing to do the homework, part of the homework is real simple. Some of the best advice I ever got, read up. Meaning, read good writers. Understand how they're telling a story, the economy of words, the economy of adjectives and adverbs. Like, understanding and, and really, like, choose writers that you, authors that you really, really admire. What makes their work so good? If you get an opportunity, go to book fairs. Uh, uh, go, go, go listen to authors talk. Uh, so understand their journey. Um, their journey will be different from your journey, but these are the ways that you start understanding the, the, the craft more and obviously take writing classes if you can. Um, so there are many ways, but you have to be committed to that. My process. And I think another thing, it took me a while to accept the title without feeling intimidated or pretentious that I want to be an author. Like that is so intimidating. Like we don't, especially, I don't know if race plays into it and and whatever, but it's almost double for us because we don't, we're like, oh, I can't be an author. And I had to keep saying, no, no, dude, just write, just write. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So give yourself permission. Um, Give yourself permission to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. Give give yourself permission to be an astrophysicist. Give yourself, I mean, like we, we get intimidated by that because People don't normally look like us. They don't normally come from where we come from. So you first have to say, I can do this. The way I'm going to do it is by studying and by understanding the craft. So that's my process and that's my advice. But read up. Read authors that inspire you. Read authors that intimidate you because they're so good. Like I, tr- I still, I, I read some people and I'm like, damn, you know, um, but they ultimately inspire me. And so that's a that's a very uh, valuable piece of information that I got that I that I pass on. And if people really, really want it, do the work. I I, I started when people would come up to me and ask, how do I get into acting? How do I get into directing? How do I? And, you know, you get inundated with that stuff sometimes. I learned the best way. And I know this sounds cruel. The best way to get rid of people is to tell them to do homework. Yep. <laughs> so oh, you know, my God. I would just, I'd give them homework. I'd give them homework, and, and, and I'd never hear from them again. Eric, and people I'm come up to me and they say, hey, I want to reach you. Oh, they got an idea. This is what I say. Send me a one sheet. Right. It never happens. Never happens. They, and I, and, and even, I, I go. A lot of them won't even learn what a one sheet is. A lot, <laughs> a lot won't even learn that. And so you just, so you get, now, the ones that do follow through, okay, now we can talk. Boom. But you will eliminate 98% of the population that's coming in. Sustained. <laughs> yeah. Sustained. So that's, that's, yeah, that's Yo, it's learned. straight up. Yo, I, I, dude, I, I spoke to some HBCU students today at Coca-Cola today. Flew to Atlanta, flew back. And I said, yo, I said, do the work. If you want all this other stuff, if you, cause I said, because people say, you know, I want, I want to do what you do. And I go, but do you want to do what I do? Right. I said, it's the work. I said, work. the work, I said, you want to, you want to, man, I see you hanging out with Dave Chappelle and Will Smith. I said, no, 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 no. That don't just happen. The work is what they're responding to, which creates the relationship. It's the work. The work. And folk and don't and want to put in they don't the work. Wanna, and writing, you know, writing is lonely, first of all. So, you know, listen, you know, a lot of us want what we see in other people. But listen, we're not all built to carry those dreams. Yep. You know what I mean? And so a lot of people aren't built, most people aren't built to carry my dream. Yep. And so we they 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 want they they look at the result of my dream. Right, right. They don't know the effort. 
of my dreams. This morning, I'm up at 4.30 in the morning um, because I'm working on my next book. Yep. And we, you know, the strike just ended. We're getting ready to go back to work. I'm executive producing and directing a new show for um, Dick Wolf on, on, on Amazon. We're getting ready to go back to work. I'm like, I'm going to be pulling double duties. I'm going to be getting up at 4.30 in the morning, getting my writing in, going to set, doing that, coming home, maybe getting some more writing in. People aren't built for that, but they see it and they're like, oh, right. my God, oh, you know, you do this, you do that. You're a director, you're a producer, you're an author. You do. They're not built for my dream. Or, or, and- or just listen. I mean, listen, when, we, when I did this here, I, I didn't have time to write it. I, 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 because of everything, this show, six other shows, and I was like, I need a ghostwriter. Literally, it was like three years. Jan was like, yo, where the book? I was like, Jan, I, I literally do not have the time. Met a, met a sister in San Antonio, the NAACP. She told me about a ghostwriter. I was on the phone with her the next night. And so here's what was interesting. So, Eric, we're sitting there going through this here. And so they're like, uh, well, uh, who's name going to go? I was like, yeah, we put her name on. I was like, I ain't tripping. Right. So what we did was we did a series of, I did a series of audio brain dumps. I, I, she would like, we would talk for two or three hours, and I would basically articulate the book. Right. Thoughts, visions, this, 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 this here. Then she would then put it together. We, w- we probably had about six, eight, ten conversations. But I knew that. Now, other people, they can go into a cocoon. I right. know I didn't have that time. So it's understand. And so then, then it was like, like I say, so I wasn't tripping even on putting the name. I was like, y'all, I'm good. I, I, like, I don't need to have just my name. My, right. my ego, fine. But, right. but when you understand what your limitations are, what your skill set is, then you can sort of craft this. And so that's why, as I tell people, you can't say you want to do what I do if you don't want to do what I do. You can't, you're not strong enough to care. And listen, I, and I'll flip it. You know, my, my best friend is Michael Beach. And, and, and Mike Beach is a, is a gym rat. This dude works out like Yeah, I, I, I see his right. Instagram, yep. This dude is just ripped, right? So every once in a while, you know, and I do my, I do my exercise, I do my stuff, whatever. But every once in a while, I'll be like, damn, I want to be shredded like Mike. But guess what? I ain't willing to put in the work that Mike does. I'm not willing to put in the diet. I'm not willing to, I love food. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I, I do, I do enough. I do enough to maintain. I do enough so I ain't got a beer gut. You know what I mean? I, not that I drink beer, but I'm just saying, I, I don't have a pot belly. I do just enough. So, but see, I, but I, I go, okay, that's not my passion. Right, right. And so I'm not trying to be a professional, but I, but I look at that and I go, man, I, you know, that envy kicks in, but I don't, my legs aren't strong enough to carry his dream. There are many people that their legs aren't strong enough to carry my dream. They're not willing to get up at 4.30 in the morning. They're not willing there you to go. stay up till 2 in the morning. They're not willing to do these things. So you can't have that. And that's, that's the key thing. So know what your legs are strong enough to carry and let that be your dream. You nailed it, y'all. Eric LaSalle's new book is called Laws of Annihilation. Dick Wolf says LaSalle conquers yet another medium. A really great read. Of course, Dick Wolf, a producer of the Law and Order series. Y'all, uh, if you are a lover of fiction, check it out. It's uh, the third in uh, a trilogy. Get those as yep. well. Some people in the chat have already said they ordered it. My brother, always good to see you, man. Uh, congratulations you, on this. Uh, and good luck. All the success to you. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to your panel, man. Really, really, really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I'm, you can hit me on social, uh, my website. I like to stay in touch with readers and book clubs. Uh, so, yeah, check it out. Let me know what they think. But thank you. Thanks for having me, brother. Really uh, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Cool. Folks, going to a quick break. We're going to come back talking to the sculptor of a statue in Arkansas of John H. Johnson, founder of Ebony and Jet Magazine. You're watching Roland Martin on the Filters on the Black Star Network. Barnes and next on the frequency, we have Brio, performance artist and author, writer, singer, and composer, Queen Mother Nana Camille Yarbrough 
please join us for an an incredible conversation of knowledge, wisdom, and power of the elders. I'm a perception changer. You're a rearranger. You're a mind evolver and a problem solver. You're a beast eater, a soul excreter, a void filler and a bile spiller. You are a thought warmer, a plan former, a power orchestrator, and a tongue translator. Right here on the Frequency on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Publishing icon, Johnny's Johnson, has been honored with a new sculpture in his hometown uh, there in Arkansas. Of course, Johnny's Johnson, founder, Ebony Jet Magazine, Negro Digest. He was born in Arkansas City, Arkansas, in 1918 before moving to Chicago. Of course, he created the publishing company uh, Empire in Chicago, known worldwide for its influential black magazines. Uh, Little Rock sculptor Susan Holly Williams created the historic sculpture of Johnson. She joins us now from Chicago. Glad to have you on the show. Um, One of the things that I like to do when I travel, I I love to, if, if, uh, if I'm flying somewhere, if I'm going through an airport, I might be traveling somewhere and I might come upon on a campus or whatever, you know, a, a, a sculpture or something like that dedicated to an African-American. love to take a photo and post it. But I think it's important that we understand that in a country where racist um, erected numerous statues and monuments to domestic terrorists, it's important for us to understand and recognize what I call our black superheroes. And John S. Johnson certainly was one of them. Absolutely. How did you get involved in this project? Uh, I'm a sculptor, and uh, I am friends with one of the friends of J.H. Johnson, which is a committee that um, is uh, empowered to look after the legacy of John Johnson and do everything, basically ambassadors for John H. Johnson. And one of the friends on that committee is a friend of mine, who knew me as a sculptor and just reached out to me and see if I was still doing sculpture and if I was interested in this project. So, of course, I was. How long did it take? Ooh, it took me about nine months to complete the sculpture. And what did you base it off of? I see, uh, guys, go to, the, go to the photos right here. Uh, mm-hmm. You said multiple pe- No, 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 as of, of her working. No, you had it in the preview window. Go to, go back, go back. I'm trying to... Yeah. So there were some photos. You had multiple photos there. So was there a particular photo or did you put together several several to create uh, this piece? I would say I put together hundreds of photos to create that piece because I was asked to create John Johnson at a particular age. Mm -hmm. The pictures that I had of John Johnson were from age maybe 30 up to 80. So trying to find him. Uh, in the space between 60 and 70, I had to go through a lot of photos to accomplish that. Gotcha. Uh, and um, you, you said it took nine months. And, and obviously, whenever this happens, and we see this this all the time, when there's a, people always go, "That don't look like him," or "That looks like him." <laughs> it, so, so I mean, so it how, looks like him. So, so, so what I'm saying, but it, it all that's always like the one. I don't care if it's a king statue or <laughs> it was whatever. I mean, I, I mean, matter of fact, I forgot what city they had a king statue, and these people lost their mind. They they took the thing Boston. down. 
Yes. You said it was. Yes. You said bought. Yeah, I mean, they, they were like, uh, no, that ain't it. That, they're like, that ain't it. That ain't it. Uh, yes. and, so that's a lot of pressure on the sculptor. Absolutely. And Linda put a lot. Linda Rice Johnson uh, put a lot of pressure on me to make it look like her father. So I wanted to make sure it did look like her father. So I spent probably ninety percent of my time making sure it looked like her father, and not just looking like him, but I wanted the essence of him. I wanted to create a moment in time of what he was thinking about. So I wanted to get that expression just right. So it wasn't just look like him, but it was all of those other um, parts involved. Uh, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Panelists, questions. Uh, Matt, you first. Um, this is an exquisite work. And I guess my question for you is just what are your thoughts about the importance of public monument? And, and I ask that because when we look from history, we have things that have you know, transcended eons that we still revere in museums, right? So you as the sculptor who has actually captured his essence, what do you think the importance is of public monument to those like John H. Johnson who moved us forward the way that he did? I think it's an awareness. It's a place that a lot of people can go and see and um, appreciate what, what we have left, the legacy that we've left behind as African-Americans and Mr. Johnson, uh, being an African-American who is known for his business sense, is kind of rare for African-American sculptures. Uh, the ones that I've seen, the public sculptures that I've seen, are generally um, uh, religious sculptures, um, professional athletes, um, politicians. But it's rare that you see um, a business professional um, presented and um, ce um, celebrated because of their business acumen. So I think that's very important, and I think um, being public there is just that, I mean, I could do one and keep it at home. It won't do any good. But if you put it out there in the public, it, you can share with so many other people. Joy? All right. So I want to know, if you want to, if you're a student out there, and we're always talking about dreams. If you're a student out there and you want to become a sculpture artist, right? How mm -hmm. do you do it? I mean, what an amazing career. But how do you do it? Well, it's a rare career, first of all. And I didn't know anything about it when I was a student. And I've also taught uh, um, art in high school. Uh, it's just, first of all, you need the talent and you need the desire to do it. And um, I think once you get the, the talent and the skill level, uh, you just continue and learn. You educate yourself. You go to school. I have a degree in art. Um, sorry, not art. I have a degree in interior design. Uh, and, but I taught art for years. So it's just something that you just need to hone for years and years and not give up on. I taught uh, art and I also taught home economics. I worked as an interior designer for a lot of years, too. But I had that passion for art in my heart, and I just couldn't let it go. So that's something, if you have that, you just have to keep it and hone it and never let it go. That's something I can't let go. Michael. You have the talent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so John H. Johnson is one of my heroes as well. I've studied, studied him in the past. Did you do any research on John H. Johnson and his history to help inspire you in the sculpting? And if so, um, Nate, what was something significant that you learned about him that you did not already know? A lot. <laughs> I read his book, <laughs> uh, Succeeded Against the Odds. And mm -hmm. uh, I've known about John S. Johnson because I grew up in that era where you had, we had the Jet, Jet and Ebony right. magazines at, on our coffee table. We had sisters. I had sisters that fought over the magazine. Uh, but reading his book taught me a lot about his business practices and taught me a lot about his personal life and his the grit that he had. And now I know how he was able to accomplish what he did because he was raised in Arkansas City, which was a tough life. And when he got to Chicago, he was prepared for that. So reading his book and talking to Linda, his daughter, uh, was very important to me. It helped a lot into producing this piece of art. All right, thank you. All right, then. Um, it is... Uh, a fantastic piece. Uh, we appreciate uh, the work that you did. Uh, what you working on now? I am working on a couple of more commission pieces, which is what I'm really wanting to do with my life, is just to do a lot of commission work. Uh, but I'd like to thank you, Roland, for having me on this show. 
this is just another way to um, share the legacy of John H. Johnson, especially for the people, the younger folks who don't know John H. Johnson. I have run into so many young folks who say, who is that? And it's a shame that I have to explain to them. But the other thing is I'm working on getting John H. Johnson in Chicago. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to get John H. Johnson in Michigan Avenue in front of the old Ebony and Jet headquarters on Michigan. I spent a lot of time down there, probably too much time, but I would love to see him down there on my trips down to Michigan Avenue. Well, I had, of course, uh, I had the advantage of uh, uh, meeting him, had the advantage of um, of uh, uh, talking to him um, on, on numerous occasions. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he was, uh, of course, also a great alpha man. Uh, and, Absolutely. And, and, and you guys were represented in Arkansas. And then when you, and then when you talk <laughs> about uh, how do you pay homage, we actually do this. So oh uh, I, cr I actually uh, 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 created this. Uh, my graphic designer put this together. And so when we launched this show, uh, I wanted to do so. So we have these murals in all these offices. And so this is uh, dedicated to black-owned media uh, outlets. And as you see, uh, we have uh, Ebony on here. We have Negro Digest uh, on here. Uh, we have Jet on here. And there are others, The Crisis, uh, other black newspapers. And so uh, this is uh, one of the ways for that. Uh, so every day, uh, this is my office. And so this is in here. And so trust me. Uh, what we do here, uh, these are the people who did it before us to make all of this possible. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. All that's right. Absolutely wonderful. Indeed. Well, look, we appreciate it. All right, come on, come on, y'all. Switch shots. There you go. All right. Wonderful talking to you guys. Well, likewise. Good luck. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Take care. All right, Susan, thank you very much. All right, that's it for us. Matt, Joy, as well as Michael, thanks a bunch. Glad y'all could join us uh, for today's show. Uh, it, it is uh, going to be a little fun this weekend. It's birthday weekend. My birthday's on Tuesday. Uh, my nephew Chris' birthday is Sunday. My brother's birthday is Monday. Uh, my birthday is um, Tuesday, and so looking forward to that. Uh, it will be a weekend of golf. Y'all know that. Uh, I want to play this. I want, hold on. Which phone am I using? Which one's the shot on? So like I say, I was at Coca-Cola today um, speaking to some of the HBCU students there. Uh, and where is it? Here we go. Um, let me cue this thing up. So uh, they had one of their programs there. And so I, I spoke to them, had a great time uh, chatting with them. Uh, and so uh, we took a uh, big group photo. And while they also did a big old shout out, turn the audio up, please. All right, here we go. Hey, hey, count. All right, one, two, three. HBCU! So we enjoyed, uh, enjoyed talking to them and seeing them uh, there. Folks, uh, we want you to uh, show your appreciation for what we do. Uh, what we do here uh, is not easy and it's also not free. Uh, and so when you contribute to our Bring the Funk fan club, you make all of this possible. Uh, and trust me, uh, when it comes to traveling across this country, covering the news, booking the shows, all of this equipment we talk about here. And, and I, I, I do this, I do this all the time. And people, and people, um, and I try to tell them that uh, it's that it, it's real. When you see this studio, when you see when you see this studio, when you see all the things here, when you see uh, the cost of uh, when you talk about this facility, our production room, uh, the Skype machine, our our streaming unit, all this sort of stuff, it's about one hundred ninety-five thousand dollars a month to pay for the entire network, uh, and so um, it absolutely matters. Uh, when uh, you support us. And so I want you to do that. You can see your check and money orders at P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., uh, 20037-0196, Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered, PayPal or Martin Unfiltered, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at bookstores nationwide. Uh, you can also get the audio version on Audible, and be sure to check out our 24 hour streaming channels. They're available uh, on uh, Amazon News. So you go to Amazon Fire, check out Amazon News. You can tell Alexa to play news from the Black Star Network. You can also check us out on Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, as well as uh, Amazon Prime Video. 
We always end the show Friday uh, showing all of our donors. We thank you for your contributions. And those of you who give uh, right now, this weekend, you will be uh, added to that list as well. Thanks a bunch, folks. Holla!